When you start looking into the racial wealth gap, there's a moment in U.S. history towards the end of slavery that's inescapable. It's 1865, during the final months of the Civil War, and Union General William Tecumseh Sherman and his army had just marched across Georgia to capture Savannah. And he issues a field order that sets aside land in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida for freed slaves that they would own and live and work on. This is known as 40 acres and a mule. It's often talked about as something that could have changed the trajectory of the racial wealth gap today, if it ever actually happened. After President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, his successor, Andrew Johnson, famously rescinded the offer. He lacked all of Lincoln's capacity for greatness. Uh, he was deeply, deeply racist. He couldn't have cared less about the fate of the former slaves. And uh, he uh, restored white supremacy as quickly as he could. That's Eric Foner. He's a professor emeritus of history at Columbia University in New York and has written several books on Civil War era history. He says this moment was a huge missed opportunity for building black wealth. By some estimates, that land would have been worth as much as $3.1 trillion today. But it wasn't the end of the conversation about giving an economic future to former slaves. During Reconstruction, after the Civil War, um, former slaves and some white allies insisted that genuine freedom required some kind of economic base and that in an agricultural society, that meant owning land. In 1866, a congressman named Thaddeus Stevens proposed an amendment to a bill that would have confiscated all the land from plantation owners, split it up, and given it to former slaves and the people who fought for their freedom. We especially insist that the property of the chief rebels should be seized and used for the payment of the national debt caused by the unjust and wicked war they instigated. The whole fabric of Southern society must be changed, and never can it be done if this opportunity is lost. One reason to redistribute the land was political. The Republicans in Congress wanted to dilute the economic power of Southern landowners. But there was another reason, too. You needed to break up the plantations and distribute the land. This was the only way that African-Americans would avoid being economically dependent on their former owners. They wouldn't really then be free. Johnson may have been president, but Congress at that time was run by radical Republicans like Stevens, who were rapidly passing laws to expand the rights of Black people. They passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that abolished slavery, granted citizenship to anyone born in the U.S., including slaves, and gave Black men the right to vote. Congress debated the land issue, but never took it up seriously. The economic revolution did not go as far as the political revolution. Congress did not pick up the uh, banner of 40 acres and a mule. It was considered too unprecedented. You know, it, you know, it was just not something that was part of the American tradition in some ways. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long. A hundred years later, Martin Luther King Jr. would lead a civil rights revolution not seen since Reconstruction. The movement would help end segregation and laws that made it almost impossible for Black people to vote. But even after those victories, he would talk about the problem they didn't solve. Economically, the Negro is worth worse off today than he was 15 and 20 years ago. And so the unemployment rate among whites at one time was about the same as the unemployment rate among Negroes. But today the unemployment rate among Negroes is twice that of whites. That's Martin Luther King Jr.'s The Other America speech at Stanford University in April 1967. But we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. 
It's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good, solid job. Economic justice was next on King's agenda, but he was never able to achieve it. A year later, he was assassinated in Memphis. The data shows that the median white family has 10 times more wealth than the average black family. One of the drivers of that wealth gap is redlining, the practice of mortgage lenders denying loans to people based on their race or where they live. We have lived under these intolerable conditions for how many years? Maybe 400 years. I feel that the way to bring about equality of black people in the system is what through economic... What about equality of white people? Now, I'm going to interrupt you up time you keep calling black people. To keep us at the bottom of the economic ladder, the bottom of the housing ladder, the bottom of the educational ladder. I was prepared to try to get used to having a colored family in the block. Well, now there's another one across the street, and pretty soon there'll be one next door. And before you know it, those streets are going to start looking like Harlem. Why don't you well, I don't want to live in a colored slum. I don't want to live in a colored slum. Is that so terrible? Welcome back to The Paycheck. I'm Jackie Simmons. And I'm Rebecca Greenfield. Last time we discussed what wealth is, why it matters, and how you get it. Today, we're going to talk about the 400 plus years of history that led to America's wealth gap. If you want to look at the origins of the racial wealth gap, there's a pretty good place to start. 250 years of unpaid labor, that's going to create a pretty large gap between the people who are slaves and the people who are owners. That's Eric Foner again. Slavery not only robbed Black people of wealth, but Black people's labor and bodies created a huge amount of wealth for white people. To understand the enormity of this, Foner says there's a stat that he always used to tell his students when teaching them about the history of the wealth gap. The economic value of the four million slaves was an average of $1,000 per person or about $4 billion altogether, the banks, railroads, and factories in the United States all put together were worth about $3.5 billion. Not only was all of this wealth in the hands of white people, but a lot of it was in the hands of white people who had a strong economic interest in keeping black people enslaved, or at the very least, economically subservient. The history of wealth generation in the U.S. is filled with figures like these that help us understand the enormity of the racial wealth gap. We asked our colleague, Katerina Sariva, an economics reporter at Bloomberg, if she could do the math to show not just the losses endured by black people, but the huge economic gains created for white people. Hey, Katerina, welcome to The Paycheck. Hi, thanks for having me. So if we're going to go back into U.S. history to look at the wealth gap over time, where do we start? Okay, for our purposes today, we're going to start with pre-Civil War America. But before we do that, I'm going to give you four numbers to hold in your head. Can you do that? Yeah, totally. Okay, $42 trillion, $270 million, $200 million, and 75. You got that? Yeah, 42 trillion, 270 million, 200 million, and 75. You got it, Jackie? Yep, noted. Great. We'll start with the first number, $42 trillion. That $4 billion figure that Eric Foner talked about, that would amount to as much as $42 trillion in today's money. That shows you just how much wealth was created for slave owners. So in the high end, That's like double the entire U.S. economy today. Exactly. And that doesn't include all the lost wages and income that Black people never got for their free labor. The U.S. used enslaved labor for almost 250 years. Thomas Kramer, a professor of public policy at the University of Connecticut, calculated that from the founding of the country in 1776 
to the end of slavery in 1865, that amounted to $20 trillion in today's money. And it's also important to understand that owning slaves didn't just make white people rich. It helped them get richer. I called up a couple economists and historians to have them help me with some of this math. If you own slaves, that was an asset on which you could gain leverage to buy more stuff. And that's how you get rich is you have assets that produce wealth and then you can get more credit based on those assets. That's Marissa Baradaran, a law professor and associate dean at the UC Irvine School of Law and the author of The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. She brings us to the second way we can look at wealth created by slavery. It wasn't just slave owners who profited, it was everyone connected to the slave economy, which at this point in U.S. history was most people. Cotton was by and far the largest export at the time. Big banks like J.P. Morgan and Lehman Brothers got rich financing its trade. There were literally slave-backed securities. The entire economy of some southern towns, down to the smallest shopkeepers, depended on the cotton trade. So are we coming to another one of your numbers? No. So I really wanted to find an exact number for this. And I asked a bunch of people, but it's really hard to quantify this because slavery was just such a big part of the U.S. economy. One of the things most people agree on, though, is that the U.S. would probably not be the world's biggest economy today without its slave history. Okay, but once slavery is abolished, what happens to that $4 billion of slave labor? Right. So they lost those human assets, and that was a massive loss in wealth. But a recent study found that within a generation, the grandsons of slave owners recovered all that wealth. The researchers attributed to a few things, a network of professional relationships that allowed them to start new businesses, and they created a legal environment that allowed them to continue to exploit black labor. After the Civil War, there was some talk about how to set black people up for their free lives and shore up some of these differences that 40 acres and a mule promise. As we know, that never happens. And there was something else going on in the middle of America that had big implications for the wealth gap. That condition of the denial of the 40 acres was accompanied by a situation in which one and a half million white families received 160 acre land grants in the western part of the United States. That's William Darity better known as Sandy, an economist at Duke University who I talked to about this. What he's talking about are the Homestead Acts. And here's my second number. The Acts were a series of bills that were meant to encourage settlement of the American West by giving away 270 million acres of land largely stolen from Native Americans. So at this point, Black people are free. Are they able to get any of that? It's complicated. The original Homestead Act was passed in 1862, when most Black people were still enslaved. There was a Southern Homestead Act in 1866 that was open to Black applicants, but the land prices were often still too expensive, so the vast majority of this went to white people. It's hard to quantify the value of the land today, but the social scientist Trina Shanks estimates that 48 million mostly white Americans today are descendants of these original homesteaders. But there were some Black families, like mine, who were able to acquire land. Yeah, but the economic hardships of the post-Civil War period, the fact that plantation owners now had to pay for their labor, only increased racial resentment toward Black people. In the South, this led to the Jim Crow laws that severely limited Black people's freedoms, what jobs they could do, if they could own property, where they could live, which kept them poor and in many cases indebted to their former owners. Here's Eric Foner again. Blacks found themselves locked into the lowest rungs on the ladder in in what was now the poorest region in the United States anyway. 
So they were at the bottom of the bottom. It was very difficult to move up from there. Plus, that was accompanied by violence toward anyone who bucked the racial norms, like Black people who accumulated any kind of wealth. One of the most egregious incidents was the Tulsa Massacre of 1921 that destroyed a Black neighborhood that was so prosperous in its businesses and home ownership that it was known as Black Wall Street. In one day, thousands of white rioters, including police officers, burned down hundreds of homes and businesses, displacing 10,000 Black Tulsans. They even used World War I bomber planes to burn the city. And that's where we get to my next number, $200 million. That's how much wealth was destroyed in Tulsa in today's dollars. But it wasn't an isolated incident. Sandy Darity says there were around 100 of these attacks from the end of the Civil War into the 1940s. Hundreds of thousands of Americans were members of the Ku Klux Klan, and there were around 3,000 lynchings between 1870 and 1940. So slavery itself created a multi-trillion dollar wealth gap. And the period after slavery didn't do much to close it because of things like the Homestead Acts and all this racial violence. Yeah, that's right. And none of that includes the one thing most people can trace their wealth back to, home ownership. There were two important policies that brought home ownership to the masses in the 20th century. In the presence of senators, congressmen, and the heads of veterans' organizations, President Roosevelt signs G.I. Joe's Bill of Rights. The pens will become valuable souvenirs of the occasion that guarantees a returning soldier a year of unemployment insurance, guarantees 50% of loans up to $2,000, and helps pay for the completion of his schooling. In 1934, the National Housing Act created a system where the U.S. government, for the first time, guaranteed mortgages. And then the GI Bill helped veterans returning from World War II access low-interest loans to help cover certain expenses, like homes. You no longer needed a pile of money to buy a house. This not only allowed many more people to own homes, but because people could leverage these assets to take out a loan to start a business or pay for their kids' college education, it became a huge way to build more wealth. Black people were almost entirely left out of this. And it did not, you know, accidentally leave out people of certain races. It did so explicitly, um, methodically. What Mersa Baradaran is talking about is redlining. Now that the government had a vested interest in making sure its loans got paid back, it came up with a system for assessing risk to do just that. It created maps that deemed certain neighborhoods safe bets and others so risky that banks wouldn't readily lend to people looking to buy there. And this system, more than anything, was based on racism. So when those FHA map makers went out to survey risk for the mortgage market, they were protecting the insurance fund and they were creating a uh, a risk map across the country. You were going to go into a neighborhood, you were going to look around and say, is this a good neighborhood or is this a bad neighborhood? And so you look at these forms and they say, you know, there's a lot of quote unquote lower races in this neighborhood. And this was called redlining because they literally color coded so-called high risk, predominantly black neighborhoods red. So black people were either denied mortgages or they could only get very high rate loans. So in some ways, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you're stuck in a so-called undesirable zip code, it's difficult to upgrade or even improve your lifestyle. Exactly. And this had huge implications for the wealth gap. Most Americans' wealth today comes from home ownership. This systemic exclusion of Black people from buying many of the country's most desirable homes and from affordable loans is the reason we have such a large racial wealth gap today. Nearly 75% of white families own homes, while less than half of Black families do. That was my last number. And you might be wondering why I'm stopping before we get to the civil rights era. That's because while the civil rights movement had a lot of success in ending legal segregation, 
there was much more resistance to fixing the housing problem and other economic issues that directly contributed to the wealth gap. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. Can you give a basis for that judgment? Yes, we used to live in Washington, D.C., and we saw a very good example of that there. For years, various bills languished in the House and Senate until April of 1968. The day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, President Lyndon Johnson sent a letter to Congress urging the passage of the Fair Housing Act. And less than a week later, the bill finally passed. Now with this bill... The voice of justice speaks again. It proclaims that fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. This law and others later on make discriminatory practices like redlining illegal, but they were weak and they didn't correct for the decades of damage already done. In 1967, white families had five times the wealth of black families. Today, they have seven times the wealth. That's why Martin Luther King Jr.'s words still ring true. It is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And the fact is that millions of Negroes, as a result, centuries of denial and neglect have been left bootless and they find themselves impoverished aliens in this affluent society and that is a great deal that the society can and must do if the Negro is to gain the economic security that he needs now one of the answers it seems to me is a guaranteed annual income, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. A confluence of things put the country on track for today's racial wealth gap, and the legacy of these moments continues to play out. For the next couple of episodes, we're gonna dig into how black people are still being left out of major vehicles for wealth building. First up, land. So here this farmer had received a farm operating loan for $157,000. He hadn't even done the paperwork, uh, the correct paperwork on the loan. And I was uh, pretty much uh, begging and pleading for a $5,000 operating loan. And he had this conversation with Farmer Earl as though I wasn't visible. Before we go, we have a request for you. Experts estimate that closing the racial wealth gap would take around $13 trillion, give or take a trillion or two. That works out to about $300,000 for every Black American. We'd like to know, what would you do with that $300,000? How might it change your life? How might your life stay the same? Record a voice memo with your answers to these questions and email it to me at rgreenfield at bloomberg.net or call and leave us a voicemail at 646-324-3490. Thanks for listening to The Paycheck. If you like this show, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Rebecca Greenfield. And me, Jackie Simmons. Today's episode was edited by Rebecca Greenfield and reported with the help of Katerina Sariva and Lanon Nguyen. Our producers are Magnus Henriksen, Lindsay Cradowell, and Ethan Brooks. Our original music is by Leo Sidrin. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. Special thanks to Topher Forges. We'll see you next time. <laughs>